Hey guys, welcome back to AIT 1002 Power Development. This is Lesson 2 uh, Alternators. We're going to get into how we develop power. Uh, if you remember from Lesson 1, we talked about four or five different sources of electricity, but one of the most significant to us is going to be magnetism. How we use magnetism in order to power the power grid across the United States, everything from our home and our industries and our businesses, uh, even now to charging our cell phones, okay? We use magnetism to create the power that we use, okay? A little fact here for you. Uh, about 50% of the power that we use in the United States comes from coal, okay? Which is a good thing for our area in Western Kentucky. And also another, about 22% uh, comes from natural gas. And then you also have nuclear power as well. Uh, another 6%, the nuclear makes up about 20%, and we use about 6% of our power uh, that's generated from hydroelectric. We got some other renewables like solar and wind and things like that uh, that make up a very small portion of it at this point. Uh, but you can see kind of where the pie chart tells you where we're getting most of our uh, energy sources to create the power that we use, okay? So first of all, I'm going to just briefly touch on this because you're going to see a common theme with these. Uh, with hydropower, what we're doing is we're taking dam a dammed up river Okay? And we are releasing the water, and as the water is released, it goes across the turbine and spins the turbine. The turbine is um, <clears throat> attached to a shaft that has a rotor on the end of it, okay? and it's spinning a magnetic field in between a set of coils. Okay? If you remember from our lesson, there's two ways that you can create voltage, and that is by spinning a magnetic field uh, in, a set of, in a coil of wire okay? uh, between two coils or you can take a coil of wire and, and spin it around uh, the magnetic field and it will produce a voltage as well. But in, if you spin this turbine and we spin this rotor, we wind up with three phases of voltage coming out of our power plant, feeding our power grid, going down these transmission lines that you see uh, as you're driving down the highway. And it is in three phases, okay? We're gonna get into three phases, we're gonna explain it and break it down for you. But that's how hydropower works, okay? Just another graphic, you're doing the same thing. They have the water being released, we call it the pinstock, down through the pinstock, and it spins the turbine, create, and that in turn spins the alternator, okay? Uh, and it's gonna run very similar to the way your alternator runs in your car, okay, the same principles, and we provide power across our transmission lines, feed the power grid in the United States, okay? Another way we do this, this is with nuclear power, okay? We have a nuclear reactor with, uh, with uh, these uh, nuclear rods, with these uranium, uh, as our fuel, and through the uh, through fusion, excuse me, uh, we will create a tremendous amount of heat that goes through a water source that's being piped through a water source, and it creates steam. That it turns that it heats that water to the point of a lot of steam, and we push that steam across a turbine, and that turbine spins just much like the hydroelectric one does, and it too is tied to a shaft that's got a rotor inside of an alternator, and we create our three phase voltage that goes out and handles business for us as far as power throughout, our, uh, throughout the United States, okay? Uh, with um, coal, all right, we do the same thing. We're just using a different fuel source, okay? Fuel, uh, coal is burned and we create heat uh, that boils water. The water turns to steam. We, press, we push that steam across the turbine. The shaft is then spinning the rotor and we got three phases of voltage going out onto our power grid. Starting to see a theme here, aren't you? turbines and alternators and spinning, okay? The difference is the fuel sources that we're using to spin that turbine, okay? Here's an image of a turbine. This thing is huge. Uh, it's gotta be critically balanced, I mean, just almost perfection, uh, because it spins at such a high RPM and it is so heavy. Uh, and if it's out of balance, it shakes and rattles and rolls and, and you know, it'll tear itself apart. So this is inside of a power plant, inside of a turbine. It looks a lot like a jet engine turbine um, that uh, I used to work on. Uh, when I was in aviation, okay? But anyway, these feed the power grid that's, that you see these, these um, transmission towers going down the road. You see these uh, lines, and this is where the power's coming from. It's, it's being put on these lines and transmitted down uh, our highways and to our neighborhoods and homes and things like that, okay? Again, like I said, coal uh, is gonna be the primary source right now uh, in the United States and uh, we're creating steam and we're spinning across that turbine, that turbine, the generator, and you have three phases, okay? Now, when you go down the road, you'll see these transmission towers, too. 
and you'll, you'll notice three, three wires or three sets of wires. In this particular case, I'm not sure if you can count these or not, you'll see three sets of wires going across here and you'll find some other ones going there along with it, single wires. Those are grounds, but most of your three phases will run either in single conductors or parallel conductors for, for each phase, and we're trying to keep them separated as well. So that's, that's just, and this is inside a power plant, okay? This is what the huge alternators at Big Rivers and uh, TVA, the Paradise Plant and TVA, and um, a lot of the other plants across the United States look like. It's a huge generator inside this generating room and uh, this is where the three-phase power is uh, developed, okay? Now, when I'm talking about three-phase power, I'm gonna give you a little history lesson here, okay? It's kinda cool. This three-phase power was developed by a guy named Nikola Tesla, okay? He's not the, he's not the guy that makes the cars, okay? It's way before his time, uh, before Tesla car time. Nikola Tesla from, came from, I think, Serbia. Uh, he was an inventor um, and a physicist, a scientist, and really, really just genius guy, okay? He uh, worked for Thomas Alva Edison, who had a lot of inventions on his own, the light bulb for being one of them. Okay, uh, Edison was primarily dealing with direct current, DC. Okay, we talked about that in the first lesson. His thing was he felt like everything needed to be run off of DC voltage. That's what he knew, that's what he did. He made a lot of money doing that, so he wanted to keep that intact. Well, um, Tesla worked for him, but he was working, doing some experiments and stuff on the side, and he developed the three-phase alternating current system. Okay. Well, uh, Edison didn't want any part of that. Now, we'll go into that in just a second. But he invented this three-phase AC system, and he also invented the three-phase AC motor. And these two worked hand in hand, okay? And one of the advantages of the three-phase system is that three-phase AC uh, voltage transmits so much better across long distances than does the DC, okay? Now, there was a, if you ever get a chance, get on YouTube and uh, search for the Tesla Edison story. These two, after he went out on his own, after Tesla went out on his own, left Edison, they battled back and forth as to whose system was better. Edison was stuck in his way, he was just would not budge. Tesla really had the better system, and that's what we're using today, obviously. Uh, his system won out. But like, for example, this DC system of Edison's, this is a, this is a, a power and lighting uh, diagram for a small section of the city. He's got this uh, big generating uh, plant that spins the, uh, this axle and the shaft, and it turns all these little generators. The reason they have to have all these little generators is because you can't transmit uh, DC voltage very far without it having a lot of voltage loss. You know, so it could only it could only go like maybe uh, maybe a few blocks, and you have to have another power generating station, and a few blocks after that. So you, you had a lot of equipment, a lot of maintenance. Just wasn't a real efficient and good system. With the three phase system, you could transform, uh, step up the voltage with a transformer, which you cannot do with DC. You cannot transform DC, but you can transform AC voltage up to a much higher voltage and transmit it across the lines. And the higher the voltage, the less losses that you have. So you can go further distances with losses without the losses, and you can use smaller conductors as well. So it's a lot cheaper to do. So eventually, you know, like I said, this war went on between the two. And eventually Tesla won. He got to do a little happy victory dance on his grave. But that's just a little history there. And that's how we wound up with the three-phase system running everything uh, in the United States. Now, we do peel off uh, one of the phases and use single phase in our homes. For example, um, the, the motors and things that we use in our homes, our garage door openers, our washing machines, and things, dryers, and things like that. These are small motors that don't have a lot of torque, don't have a lot of horsepower, and so single phase can handle these. Now, it would be more expensive to put three phase in your house, but you don't need three phase in your homes because, like I said, these small motors that we've got uh, in our homes, like I said, the, the dryer, the washer, the garage door opener, they're very small demand, so single phase can handle those, okay? So we don't need to incur that extra cost. But industry runs off the three phase, so we've got to have three phases uh, of voltage. I'm going to explain to you why. Okay, now let's back up and review for a second. Remember, if we move a magnet through a coil of wire, well, a wire is simply one piece of wire wrapped around a gazillion times with a beginning and it comes out on the other end. And if we move a magnet in and out of that, okay, we, make, we create a voltage. I've got a little device here in the lab. I'm, uh, my meter is broken. I'm hoping to get it replaced by the time you come into the lab for uh, the second lab here. But anyway, um, you move that magnet 
uh, in and out of a coil of wire, you're going to create a voltage, okay? Same thing is if we move a coil of wire within a magnetic field, we're going to create a voltage too, okay? That's from lesson one. But that's the basis of how uh, alternating current is developed, okay? Now, <clears throat> as opposed to DC, uh, alternating current peaks with positive and a negative within, within one cycle, okay? For example, we're here, we're moving a wire inside the magnetic field between north and south poles. So we're breaking those lines of flux. You remember that from last lesson. We're breaking those lines of flux and we are creating an alternating current. And that's, uh, by that I mean our current is changing every, t every uh, time we make one revolution with our uh, rotor inside this magnetic field. You'll notice the current is re uh, reversing, okay? We call that alternating current. Okay? And again, like I said, anytime a wire is moved within a magnetic field, we create a voltage. Anytime a magnet is moved within a coil of wire, we create a voltage. But the voltage is going to be alternating between positive and negative when we do that. Okay? So I'm going to break this down and show you. First of all, you see this symbol right here? I think I got a bigger one right here. Uh, this is the symbol for alternating current, or AC. Now remember from the lesson, first lesson, AC does not stand for air conditioning. Okay. AC is alternating current, all right? So how do we get this? This is known as a sine wave, okay? So how does this happen? How does this uh, alternating current come about? Well, first of all, as we pass our magnet uh, by a coil of wire, and it's in alignment, we're breaking the most lines of flux right there between our, mag uh, with our magnetic uh, field. We're, uh, we're passing that, um, the magnetic field in front of that coil of wire our voltage as is at its highest, it is at its peak right here, okay? So as we rotate, okay, and we get on the side, remember, this is connected to the shaft driven by the turbine that's spun by the steam or by the hydropower, okay? We're spinning this rotor, okay? So as we spin this rotor and we, we start to go away from the alignment between these two coils, something like that, we'll notice that our voltage starts to taper off until we finally get right here at about the 90 degree point, okay? And we're not aligned, our magnets are not aligned at all with these, uh, these coils. In fact, they're the furthest away from the coils that they can be. And we are creating zero voltage. This is a zero plane right here. I've got another slide I'm going to show you that too. But we're creating zero voltage. Now, as we continue to rotate and we start getting closer to the next uh, coil of wire, and our magnetic field is getting closer, we start inducing a voltage into this coil. And we start to create a, a voltage, but this time we're creating a negative voltage. The top one here is the positive, the bottom half is the negative. So as we start to approach this, when we get stronger and stronger and stronger toward the negative side, so our, our rotor is sitting now 180 degrees from where, us, where it was from here, we're now aligned like this, and we're creating a maximum negative voltage. And as we continue to spin, as we continue to spin, we are moving away from this magnet here, I mean this coil, excuse me, our magnetic field is. We're moving away and we're starting to taper off and come back closer to the zero plane, to the zero point. And this is known, uh, this is done in 360 degrees, one revolution, and it creates this sine wave. And we call that one cycle, okay? And again, this is the sine wave for what we saw just there, okay? Our zero plane right here, okay? This is the point at which no voltage is created. And that's going to be either when the, uh, the, the uh, magnet is this way or 180 degrees in this way. Creating zero voltage here, 180 degrees later, we're creating a zero voltage. We spin it another 180 degrees so that it's made one full revolution. We're back to creating zero voltage. But these peaks right here are where the magnet, magnetic field is passing closest by the coil, okay? That's where we're peaking positive, okay? And over here, we're doing the same thing at 270 degrees, all right? And there we go. And we are passing by this one, so we're creating a cycle. And this, we call this the sine wave, all right? And this is 360 degrees rotation of this. And again, going back, this is spinning because we've got it hooked to a shaft that's being spun by a turbine, okay? So that gives us our sine wave. Now, thing to note is this is one cycle over a period of time. For our purposes and in this class and for all practical purposes, the amount of time that we're looking at here is one second. So if, I, if it takes me one second to spin 
this rotor one time, 360 degrees, we call that one cycle, okay? And one cycle is also, also referred to as one hertz. We call that one and capital H, small z, H-E-R-T-Z, hertz, all right? That gives us the number of cycles. That tells us how many times we are creating cycles in one second, okay? How many rotations we're, we're making in one second, okay? So for example, uh, we start here, we got one cycle here, two cycles, three cycles, four cycles, five cycles, and six cycles within one second. That gives us six cycles in a second, or six hertz, okay? Now, if you look in your house and you see appliances such as a, maybe a space heater, a hair dryer, microwave oven, um, a washer, dryer, whatever, these devices have to be supplied with power that is delivered in 60 cycles. In other words, we've got to spin our rotor 60 times in one cycle, okay? Uh, excuse me, 60 times in one second to get 60 sine waves within that one second period. That's what the power that these devices I was talking to you about earlier, you know, with the, with the dryer and the hair dryer, the space heater, microwave, television, whatever, the electronics, they have to have 60 cycles of power to perform it like they're supposed to. Now in the United States, we have 60 cycles on our power grid. In Europe, however, they have 50 cycles, meaning that they spin their, uh, their rotors or their turbines uh, slightly slower than we do, and they have 50 cycles per second. All of their devices are designed to run on that too. Uh, so uh, when there's, there is a big difference between the two power, so uh, power systems between uh, us in Europe and some other places in the, United, in the world too. But the United States is 60 cycles. That's what everything, what everything runs on. Okay? Again, we, you can see here, uh, we got more cycles uh, in, in this period of time than we've seen before. So if we spin our rotor faster, we get more cycles in within that period of time. The period of time stays the same, but if we spin our rotor faster, we're going to be able to get more cycles in there. And again, our power plants spin their rotors. Uh, the, you know, the power plants that you see going down the road, Paradise and, and um, Big Rivers, the TVA, they spin their rotors at 60 cycles per minute, okay? Or per second, I'm sorry, excuse me, per second. Now, right here, you see you've got, a, you've got a set of coils, right? You've got one set of coils, okay? And they're 180 degrees apart from each other. So every cycle, every 180 degrees, you create that peak of power. What if, though, we took another set of coils and we placed them within our alternator, okay? This is an alternator and we put them 90 degrees from one another, okay? So now what you've got is you've got that side, you've got that peak voltage right here on the A coil, right here. These are A coil, A1, A2, okay? So we're peaking positive because they're perfectly aligned right here. They're breaking the most, we are, uh, have the strongest magnetic field passing by these coils at this point in time. Now, as we start to rotate this a little bit, we rotate away from A, so our, the power uh, that's being induced, in, the voltage being induced in the coil is starting to diminish a little bit, taper off. And you can see it in our sine wave. It's starting to taper off just a little bit, but if you'll notice, it's starting to get closer to B, the B coil right here. And as a result, B phase has been building up a little bit, building up, building up, until finally we rotate right here, and now we're, our magnetic field is closest uh, to B1, inducing the most amount of voltage into B1, and so we have a peak voltage right here, just about 90 degrees after this one, okay? You look, we're peaked to A right here, and about 90 degrees of rotation of our rotor, we're peaking, we're peaking at A. And again, as we start to rotate away a little bit, from our B coil, B starts to diminish, all right? And we're gonna to start to build in our A2 on the negative side, okay? So we start to build in our negative side. So we're 180 degrees uh, between the peak on positive and the peak on, on the negative with A, okay, 180 degrees. But we also have a little action going here on the B, B phase nine degrees later. And they're gonna peak, Bs are gonna peak uh, 180 degrees from each other as well. But the two phases, the two phases here are 90 degrees apart. Now that's two phase. We don't really use two phase. Even the, in your homes, we're using single phase. Uh, we don't really use two phase. There is no two phase that we, that we use like in industry or across our grid. 
Instead, we use three phase. So if we add an extra set of coils within our 360 degree circumference, okay, and we evenly space them, that means we're gonna have three sets of coils 120 degrees apart from each other, okay? And that will give us that third phase, all right? So, as you can see, as it passes by this blue uh, coil right here, we are, uh, we are peaking right here. As it starts to rotate 120 degrees later, our brown phase is starting to peak right here. And as we rotate uh, an additional um, two, up to the 270 degrees, another 20, 120 degrees to 270, our purple phase is peaking. Now, here's what I want you to notice. You remember in the single phase, I'm gonna back up a couple of slides, uh, this will be fine. You'll see in the single phase how it peaks and it crosses the zero plane right here. This is a point at which no voltage is being created at all. And so every, um, every uh, 360 degrees, you're gonna have three places where it doesn't create voltage, okay? So that sort of weak, a, a single phase system is a little bit weaker. And that's why it's okay in our residential areas, uh, applications, because we don't have uh, motors that have a lot of power demand, a lot of torque, okay? In industry, when you're running uh, compressors and conveyors and things like that, you gotta have a lot more torque. And that's the advantage of three phase because you never have any point in time when the uh, voltage is at zero, okay? Now the phases will be at zero, but the entire system will always be producing power, okay? So that's one of the advantages of three-phase power because things like if we're hooked to a three-phase motor right here, it would be getting three power pulses uh, and never any across the zero plane, okay? So it's gonna start up a lot, lot stronger motor, heavier horsepower, uh, more torque can be delivered because you've got power, uh, a power supply, a power ripple that will uh, supply that demand that the motor needs, okay? So uh, that is the three-phase power generation. Uh, I wanna stop the video here. Okay, I like to break these up into small chunks. So we're gonna stop right here. Uh, there's gonna be a couple more sections that we'll need to watch, but kind of digest this, look at it. Uh, make sure you're taking notes. If you've got questions, review the video. Uh, and if you've got questions, again, you, uh, you can't figure it out, uh, give me a shout, we'll talk about it, and uh, we can uh, make sure you do come away understanding, okay? So shut her off, and uh, just watch the next one, and we'll continue moving on throughout the alternators lesson. Thanks a lot.